I'm Jenny King, Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at LACMA, and I'm here with Michael Govan, CEO and Wallace Annenberg Director of LACMA. We are here to give you a walkthrough with our masks on, safely distanced from each other, and we'll start talking about the show in a minute. We're standing here in 2021, but this show was supposed to open in late March of 2020. And Michael, you and I had been working on this show for over four years at that point with Vera, who was making um, all the works that are in this exhibition here in residence. Um, how did you feel when we had to shut the doors on March 14th, which was 12 days before our planned opening on March 26th? Right. Well, uh, Jenny, it was an amazing adventure to work together on this project, working with an artist like Vera Luter. And as people will learn, it's a very unique project. I mean, it takes the meaning of artist in residence to a new level. And for that reason, we became so familiar with Vera as an artist at LACMA in residence, inhabiting our gallery space and being with us. So I think for that reason, when I remember that day, March 13th, uh, you were hanging the last pictures with her. And I think you saw me coming into the gallery and somehow sensing it was not good news because COVID was in the air, so to speak. And I, I did have to give that bad news. And I remember then Vera came over for dinner that evening and we were talking about how tragic it was because after four years of working together, we had an amazing you know, opening planned. It was gonna open with our board meeting and it was the culmination of so much inner LACMA work. And again, it wasn't like a traveling show that just landed here for an opening. This was something that was made of LACMA, from LACMA, in the galleries, and in a very intimate way. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it was so emotional <laughs> at that time. And you know, in texts and notes with the artist and between us, it's, it's just been so sad that we haven't been able to show this to the public. The other thing was that we had envisioned these pictures of inside LACMA, outside, uh, old LACMA, if you will, some of the 60s buildings and the 80s buildings is being coincident with the deconstruction of the buildings. That we, we didn't want to hide the fact that these buildings are coming down. There are very deep memories embedded for us, for people who visited them. So if they weren't capable of going on any longer physically, they still had memory. And so I hope we can talk about the fact that this project and even her work, I think, embeds deeply memory and that idea of memory. Michael, you were just talking about memory and the timing of how this show was supposed to be scheduled to coincide with our building project. And just to talk about this photograph, Rodin Garden in particular, this was um, photographed in early 2017. It's now 2021. So what we're looking at, it really no longer exists. And you see in this photograph, um, the side of the Amundsen building, you see our Cantor Sculpture Garden. And if you get in close, I was just looking at this yesterday in the catalog and I had never noticed before, you can see the cladding on the Peterson Museum um, just in the distance, which is on Wilshire Boulevard. And that leads me to a little explanation, which is that the camera obscura method Vera uses, um, and you might be better at explaining this than I am, because of the way the camera obscura works with kind of very basic optical technology, it reverses um, the world outside. So everything you see is inverted um, left, right. And then we have another inversion going on, which is the dark light tones. And that's because the light is hitting the unexposed photo paper directly. Yeah, her process is the camera obscura. It's the simplest camera that exists and it has existed for centuries, even before film. And the idea is with a small pinhole and a dark enough space, an image will be produced. And you do this as a kid sometimes in a science class. Uh, and that image that's produced inside the space or inside a camera is upside down and backwards because the image is inverted. So in this case, the image is right, left, inverted. 
it's actually upside down, but of course Vera flips it this way so that we see it correctly. <laughs> Otherwise it would be too strange to look at. But we're, you and I were inside the camera, the box, the giant room-sized box that took this picture. We were sitting with the image, and of course it was upside down and backwards. But that reversal, the negative, and sometimes people think of photographic negatives as something that gets used to make another print. In this case, these are all unique. There are no other prints. This is it, because the light has been collected over time, long time, which is why you never see people, right? Because it's too much time for a person to be seen, because they move too fast. And then you get this very still image in reverse. And so it's, the, it's like the collection of all that light. And I always think it's the collection of time. It's not just light, it's the collection of time because this is ours. Some of these uh, pictures were made over months. And so that collecting of light over time. For me personally, there's a lot of memory in this picture, but I love the fact that it's reversed because it, it's like I'm seeing its abstraction as a memory. Um, and I see the palms, you know, the wind is blowing the trees, but everything else is sharp and still. The other thing about a pinhole camera image is it's sharp from foreground to background, unlike a, another kind of photograph. But the wind makes the movement, so those trees are a little blurry. And it is, I don't know how it feels to you, Jenny, but to me it feels a little like being in a dream. And dreams aren't in reverse, but they sometimes feel in black and white. And this is what I imagine is the dream of that space. Well, picking up what you were saying, Michael, about how it captures time, but then also this interesting technical detail about how a camera obscura works, that there's this infinite depth of field and I think you can really see that contrast here because there are certain details like the musculature on the Rodin and actually for me it's like on the paving stones in the garden you can almost see like every single stone the the focus and detail is so sharp because of the way the camera works but then as you said um, the trees were blowing in the wind and so it's this inscription of the time that passes because it did take, this is a one day exposure, probably a few hours and a really bright afternoon. So then you get with the blurriness, that's not because of the lens, that's because of the inscription of the time. And the other thing I wanted to mention about this is even though I um, intellectually know that this photograph had to have been taken on a really bright sunny day and that is why the sky is so really like inky black because a bright light burns black onto photo paper. I still, in all of Vera's photographs, they feel kind of like these night scenes to me, even though I know they're daytime scenes. So I love that about this photo. Yeah, I think you're right that the night quality of that black sky is partly why it makes me think of night and dream and sleep too. I think it does add to that idea of a, and, and I don't even know if she would subscribe to that, but it's a feeling I get from them. So this photograph, um, I think both of us love this photograph. It's called Lacma from the Bridge, which is a very self-explanatory title. The camera uh, that took this photograph was hoisted onto the bridge that used to connect our Hammer building and our Art of Americas building. And in this photograph, what you're seeing is this coming together of many different architectures. So you have William Pereira with the Bing Auditorium and then Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer and the Hammer. And then in the, the distance, you have the Bruskoff Japanese Pavilion. And in real life, a view like this, when it existed, was quite eclectic. But I think Vera's photographs are able to somehow distill it. I think you said something once that she's able to make things that are, that are some might call ugly, very beautiful. <laughs> yes, I think eclectic is probably, uh, eclectic's probably a generous word for this space. And many people remarked on that, that somehow it didn't connect. And, and as the buildings rusted, um, because literally the metal rusted and they leaked and there were things, it just really started to fall apart as a pleasant space. Um, even though it's, you know, as a courtyard, courtyards are always beautiful. This is one of my favorite pictures because again, we were talking about the depth of field, that little um, handrails and perfect focus 
as is the building that's blocks away in the back, and yet the trees are blurry, blowing in the wind. So your eye is, the whole thing frames those trees. And then the most beautiful part is, of course, yes, people move too fast for the pictures, but when they move the chairs for a couple of hours, the chairs are ghost images. So, I mean, we both loved that, right? That the chairs stand in for the people and they're this motion and activity, like a film or something, that there's, there is something happening in this picture over time again. So it really emphasizes the sense of time. And yet, listen, the fountain wasn't even on. So I remember how we had the water crisis and the drought, we turned off the fountain. So nothing about the space was that pleasant by this time in the deterioration of the buildings. And it is so eclectic, but it pulls together and you know, you were the one who literally engineered this whole project with her and all the amazing logistics with, with their handlers and with uh, cranes and with moving art. But the, the, we have a great video of the camera being hoisted up on the bridge, this huge room-sized camera to make this image. So it's a, it was a Herculean effort to make this picture. So I, I guess I love it also for that reason. Well, I have a follow-up question relating to the Herculean effort. Um, as you said, we had to get a giant crane that came at like four in the morning when no one was around to hoist a 20-foot camera onto the bridge. And I wanted to ask you, um, you have a little bit of a reputation, I would say, for championing logistically difficult artist projects. So, you know, we're standing inside the Resnick Pavilion and just outside is Mike Heiser's Levitated Mass. Um, and in the other direction on Wilshire, we have Chris Burden's Urban Light. And Vera's project was a four-year project that had many logistical um, challenges that we had to troubleshoot along the way. And I wonder if you could talk kind of generally like what the appeal is for you about why you think museums should champion artist projects like this. Uh, yes. Well. So the, maybe the easiest part is to champion it. And of course, you and so many others, and I know I had a little hand in it, had to work together to make it happen. But I, I think that museums sometimes become too static. I mean, it's more comfortable for a museum to buy a picture already made, very organized, hang it in the gallery. But for me, it's artists who have always led I mean, I would say thinking about culture generally. I mean, we're, as museums, we're followers of artists. Of course we are, that seems obvious, but then often we don't let the artists show the way. We're, we can be afraid of them, or they're gonna ask too much, or it's, can we do it? And I think that the ambition of, of artists can inspire us, they inspire me, and also, I wanna say, it kinda keeps us honest. Like, it keeps the museum from being a machine, or a corporate enterprise that doesn't take on big projects, not that corporations sometimes don't, but um, I think following an artist's vision, and sometimes, you know, it can fail <laughs> for the institution and the artist, but it is just so worth trying. So whether it's moving that boulder or, or when Chris Burden called and said, oh, it's going to be that many more lamps, or <laughs> when Vera really explained what she wanted to do, because we hadn't <laughs> envisioned lifting the room size camera onto the bridge, I mean, I think it's thrilling. I know it's tough at the time, but you should tell me because we, we, I think we spent time with a lot of our coworkers who were also inspired by the energy and the vision of, of, of work like this. Very beautifully put. And I think actually you mentioned failure. I think that actually is a really um, kind of interesting part of these projects is, especially if you're someone who's a little bit of uh, type A or used to being able to control things, letting yourself be open to the possibility of failure and embracing risk um, can be really uh, educational experience, kind of eye-opening experience. It, it's images like this that really do capture that idea of I mean, her sense of memory and the way the pictures inspire memory, but real memories, because I think even in in the way those chairs move, people see themselves. I can't tell you how many meetings I had at those tables. In fact, a memorable one was with Peter Zimtor, <laughs> looking around and, and imagining what could happen. I met with other architects, Renzo Piano, uh, but also our own 
coworkers. We used to have uh, staff meetings outside. We would sit there and have our coffees in the, that very plaza before we would go into the theater for an all staff meeting. And I think the same is true for so many families from the 60s to the present who walked up those stairs or the previous stairs, went to the Bing Theater, which hosted some of the most avant-garde, I think, 70s film conversations. And so all that history is here, including the uh, Bruce Goff designed Pavilion for Japanese Art, which is one of the signature elements of LACMA. But you see how it's hidden there. Uh, it, you know, we know when the new buildings are here, that's going to be wide open, and you can already see now how it is uh, presented, I think, properly once these uh, buildings are gone. But you never want to take away that sense of memory. And, and I remember when Peter Zumtor and I were sitting at one of those tables talking about it is, is to respect the memory, uh, feel the memory. And of course, the job is to create a space that creates new memories. Like it is all about memories. That's what we hold in our heads. Uh, so I, I feel like this space is known to many. Everyone owns this space, so many of us. And Vera has done an incredible job, I think, framing it is an abstraction that everybody can participate in. So we were just talking when we were looking at LACMA from the bridge about capturing the history of LACMA, not shying away from documenting the old buildings. And this photograph was actually the concept that kind of kicked off the whole project, which was documenting an old master's gallery. And in this case, it's the kind of classic old master's gallery that was in the Amundsen building. And so we had really three types of photographs in our show, exterior shots of the museum campus, then interior gallery views, and then individual photographs of artworks, which we'll, we'll look at some in a minute. Um, but this image, I, I have to say, if I know you're not supposed to pick favorites, but it is my favorite <laughs> photograph, and there's so many things I love about it, but one of the things that immediately struck me the first time after Vera developed this and showed it to me is the, the shimmery effect of the floor. So this dark wood floor in the Amundsen building has this very light quality in the photograph that I immediately felt like it was like water almost, or like ice, um, because it's so, it was so shiny that you get these incredible reflections. Um, and even the, the pattern in the wood has a like rippling effect that is really evocative of water for me. And then so many other things. So if you think of this light, dark reversal, as you get closer to the ceiling, it's darker but actually where the, the natural shadow at the top of the wall is lighter here. So the walls almost dissolve into the dark ceiling. And then there's this kind of quirky effect where the can lights in the ceiling, which would have, where it would have had a bright light burned in these kind of black marks in the ceiling. And then I love on, on your side, this detail where the the table cast a shadow, and this white shadow looks to me like, like almost a transparent veil. So there, there's so many little subtle elements of this, of this photograph that I love. And, and then since this show has been in quarantine for 10, 10 months now, I've thought about this photograph a lot because of the poetic echo of what we've been experiencing. So this photograph took about five weeks to photograph. And during that time, people would have walked in front of the camera, but they didn't register. So what you get is this empty gallery devoid of visitors. And now for the last 10 months, we've had this beautiful show in this empty gallery devoid of visitors. So I, I have felt that there's this incredible poetic resonance between this photograph and what we've been experiencing. Uh, it's so interesting you say that, Jenny, about the emptiness and the echo, because of course we work here, so we have to be in these galleries, and so we're here usually by ourselves. I'm here with one person or two at most. And the echo of emptiness 
of that visitors being there and not being there, it really does come through in this picture as you describe it. And of course, the gallery, we knew it so well, and yet it's foreign in this picture too. The, as you say, the icy floor, the kind of constellation of dark spots in the ceiling, the fact that it's reversed, which I can never quite get my head around. Um, and it is so emotional, and I know it's emotional for you in part because of the failure. So <laughs> I actually don't know whether to tell the story sometimes when I give a tour or not. One, because it's a long story, and two, because, you know, does it cast too many other questions on, on, on the practice? But it was very near the end of a month's long exposure, because this is a very dark gallery, and so it was, I think, the longest exposure that was planned by the artist. And she, she goes in and takes a, she has test strips. So there's pieces of the image that are being exposed at the same time where she can go into the camera, it has a light lock. <laughs> and then she can pull the test strip out and develop it because there's no machine that can tell you it's five and a half months, it's four months, there's no light meter for that. And she developed it and I think it was ready. It was cooked, pretty much cooked. <laughs> that she was gonna come back, take it out, and it was ready. And I, all I remember is the horror on your face first before I talked to Vera when you had to tell me that the picture was ruined. After months, the hardest picture to make, we were about to close the museum. And I said, how could that be? A visitor shined a light in. And it took us weeks to track down that it was an accidental problem with the air conditioning system and somebody had been on the ceiling working and in efforts to find out whatever they were trying to find out they lifted a ceiling panel and the entire picture was ruined in those last two weeks uh, and I, I think Vera was so devastated that she didn't I mean it was such a long time to recover from that failure and investment all that we had put into it. And, and, and this is like, this is curatorial practice in a different way. They don't teach this in school. I remember how you kept talking to Vera about there was time. We could somehow figure out how to do it again. And, and finally, you both worked out the idea that you would do it again. Certain objects had left the gallery and she had to open the pinhole a little bit wider to make the exposure less time, which is why this picture is blurrier than the other pictures, but it, it doesn't hurt it at all because it's slight blurriness, I think, you know, creates an eerie quality to it. And I, uh, I don't know, I just, so much emotion, so much risk, time, effort, and then, you know, failure and then success, I think, because I think this picture is maybe as good as the other one. I don't know if Vera would say that. Did she ever tell you what she really felt about it? <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know if Fear and I ever have spoken about what could have been or compared, you know, what we ended up with. But it might be why I love this photograph so much. I think the other photograph, had it been successful, would have been a very different image. And I'm sure it would have been spectacular in a different way because it would have had such incredible detail. I mean, if you have a pinhole, tiny pinhole and a seven month exposure, you're gonna capture, you know, probably like every, you probably could have seen the contours on the frame against the back wall that was hundreds of feet away. And it was a much more dense install too, because in between taking this photograph and the first exposure, um, our, my colleague Leah Lembeck had her show um, to Rome and back. And so a lot of the images that were images and sculptures that were in this gallery left for that permanent collection display. And so, as you said, we have a much more sparse install here, but I actually love the tranquility of this piece. And, you know, maybe it's, it's an unconscious, um, you know, projection of, of needing to love it, but I think, I think actually it's a, a beautiful photograph. There are just a couple things on this salon style wall that I wanted to point out. Um, one of them is the meta quality of some of these images because we're standing in the Resnick Pavilion in the corner gallery and some of these photographs were taken in the Resnick Pavilion but several years ago in the same gallery. And so, um, for example, in this photograph of the African power figure, you see um, the Resnick uh, window, which we have right behind you, and you see the palm trees 
um, along the street. And you can stand here and look at the photograph and then actually look at the same view. So I love that. And, then, and I know that you love the subtle, if you wanted to talk about the reflections that you get too. Yes, if I, th these pictures are actually, I think, the origin of the project. So one of the reasons Vera was interested in staying in touch over these years is she had developed a fascination with the idea of working inside a museum, which is very hard to do, because with long exposures and public hours, uh, a camera being obtrusive, she wasn't sure if she could do it. She did a few pictures in the National Gallery, and they started her thinking, and then some in her studio, but of course, our artworks can't go to her studio. So these actually are very close to the origins of her thinking of putting her small, I call it a point and shoot, but it's actually about this big. You couldn't, it's her pocket camera, uh, where she could, on our closed days, put them in front of cases and in the space of an exhibition um, rather than the big camera. And you can tell that because as you're saying, you get the images of this space with the palm trees in the back sometimes, and you get these fantastic reflections off the cases. So this is meta in another sense, that it is about the museum and photographing and making images of objects where the reflections themselves add new features, um, whether it's, and again, shadows become light in negative, all reversed. And I think there's something magical about that. So this photograph, as I mentioned, we also had photographs of individual artworks. We built cameras that we called various copy cameras as a reference to copy stands, which no one seems to know what they are anymore. But one of the paintings that Vera wanted to reproduce, she did this really specifically for you, I think, because she knew that this painting by Peter Sanradam is one of your favorites. And, you know, the photograph is so different in some ways from the painting. I've actually never asked you, you know, what, how you feel about the photo, given that the painting is one of your favorites. Yes, I remember discussing which images, which pictures of our collection she would bring into her copy stand rooms. And copy stand is an understatement because, Jenny, you worked out to build two like small galleries for her with light locks so that we could bring safely major works from our collection. And then they could sit safely for the days and days, I think weeks that it took, sometimes 28 days to make an exposure. Uh, and of course, I was dying to know which, which picture she was going to choose and, of course, wanted to influence which ones they were, and she was not very influenceable. But I think she did uh, take a, a little bit of influence on this picture, this San Radam, because, first of all, one of the reasons I like her image is that she made it bigger. So it's a very intimate picture. That's one of the things I love about it. Um, and I think she wanted to give it that scale of architecture. San Radam was famous for these church interiors, which are so precise, they're measured. They come from architectural measured measurements that he would make before making a picture. And then they're empty, like Vera's pictures. Some, they're usually empty, not always, but they're usually empty, so it's the pure architecture, so it reminds me of her other pictures. And then there's some quality about, especially in this small painting, the real painting, um, that the values are close. Like it's not a very contrasty picture. So one of the things when I walk around this gallery and come up to it, it's not immediately evident to me it's a negative. <laughs> like it's close enough, the values, what light, dark, that for a second it could be that this is a positive picture. So I love that about it. Yeah, like in the ceiling vaulting, you, you definitely it, almost could read it not as negative. Yeah, yeah, you could read it in reverse with a with a window light lighting it. So she's made it more present. So one of the things that I was skeptical about was, so she's making copies of pictures. How will they rival or relate to the original pictures? And what's clear is in every single case, she's made a completely new image, which has a different feeling. Um, it makes us look at it in a different way. Of course, this is in reverse too. It's larger. It looks like a different... 
uh, it has a different emotion. But then there are things that are similar. And again, I know, I know she liked the picture too because of the empty architectural space. So it looks like a Vera Luter to start with. <laughs> it reminds me of the picture she made of Dia Beacon, which uh, has the columns in it and the empty space. And one of the things we were trying to do together was get as many of these pictures in LACMA's collection as possible. And so it started out with Sotheby's helping sponsor the project. And so we were able to acquire a number of pictures with their sponsorship. And then we started to love them so much, you mostly, were scrambling to find donors and people. I think that was, you did the heavy lifting on finding. Who would find people to buy them and promise them back to LACMA. And I didn't know, we didn't have a donor for this picture. And the funny story was that I was commissioned to make a lecture at Harvard Westlake School, which I didn't realize till afterwards came with a honorarium. And my immediate thought was, of course, I don't want the honorarium, but can we buy one of Vera's pictures with the honorarium? So this picture has on it Harvard Westlake School. <laughs> so there's just another inner story of how this came to LACMA. It's, it's an amazing, um, amazing image. So this painting, again, I think you encouraged Vera to look at it because it is so associated with LACMA. It uh, was the cover of one of our collection books. It's the George de la Tour, um, Magdalene with the smoking flame. And as you say, her photographs often make something completely different. And th that definitely happened here. I know I encouraged her to make an image of this or to, I don't know what, what it is, have a dialogue with this painting because this painting is so much about light. It, and it's one of the most famous paintings in our collection. It's one of the most famous paintings in, in the United States. And there, there, there are a few versions of this. One is at the, the Louvre, too. I always think ours is the best version of the, <laughs> of the Delatour Magdalene with the smoking flame. But she's contemplating the flame, light, um, mortality. You can see there's a skull on her lap. It's a very enigmatic painting. It's not clear how to read it beyond the obvious readings of, of the Magdalene and, and her thoughts that are well talked about. But there are some odd moments of the painting that actually we don't even see in this version because they're in the dark, which is in the light in this case. And, and I think this is the most estranged from its original in terms of the images Vera made, partly because the flame is so central and bright in the original painting. And what's funny about it in a good way is how light functions in, in this other meta way that that painting is about the painting of a flame, which is a, a fake of trying to be real light <laughs> from paint. And then her picture is, in, is focused, the, the biggest elements in this picture are these dark spots around the figure. That's what immediately makes you realize how different it is. And of course, those dark spots are the reflections off the varnish of the lights that were lighting this picture for the 28 days or whatever it was to make her image. And so the, those reflections now become these deep, dark circles showing the crackleur of the varnish on the painting um, in relation to that flame, which is then dark. So I'm not even sure I know how I feel in total about this painting, I, uh, this picture, I love it. I'm still figuring it out. And, and it also has a, a kind of eerie gray tone throughout, not unlike the solarized picture, another technique she uses to, to sort of make, the, make it a silvery gray. Um, it's so enigmatic, including the, the again, the, how the light plays off the texture of the painting. And you can see that the painting isn't exactly even flat because um, because of how, I guess, the, I don't even know why the, the frame is a little, um, not exactly straight, which I guess is the paper moving. Oh, right, yeah. It's such a strange image. Yeah. And I noticed you pointed out the fracture, the kind of surface texture that comes out, and it kind of almost blends into her hair and that, and that passage in the corner. And then there's almost like this sweep of tiny you know, surface texture marks. I keep thinking about how these 
pictures would look different some days shown in more of a dark gallery, like a traditional space, because here, of course, we've shown them in a modern gallery. They're new pictures shown on a white wall the way we would show sort of contemporary art. But I think some of these would blend into darker backgrounds in ways I can't quite imagine that would be really intriguing. I remember when we were discussing with Vera which pictures from our collection she would select, I was very biased for her to select old objects. One, for very practical reasons, that it's really hard to get the rights <laughs> to reproduce a modern picture. But also, I was, I was interested in this idea that here she is a contemporary artist with her obvious passion for old art, European old masters, uh, some of the South and Southeast Asian collections, the Oceanic tribal art. And so somehow I thought it was too close to her. And so I was especially surprised that she was not going to only do old pictures. That was clear. <laughs> and she, the ones she selected, which included our Jackson Pollock, uh, beautiful du buffet, which again, you can't quite see is in positive or negative. And the one that was the most surprising and I think is the most visually striking, again, transformative in how it looks at the original is this Helen Frankenthaler. And somehow I must have been out of town when this was happening <laughs> because I don't remember that much about her thinking about it. And, and I know you were working with her on even securing the rights and other things. So maybe you can tell me more about this particular image. Yeah, sure. Well, when you say um, you don't remember it, you know, a lot of the paintings are dark paintings, so they took, uh, you know, maybe two or three months. But this painting, uh, Helen Frankenthaler's Winter Hunt, is a very light painting, actually. It's like Frankenthaler's paintings on unprimed canvas, so it's actually a very light background. So the exposure time, you can always find out the exposure time by looking at the titles, which have the dates they were taken. It, this was actually four-day exposure, December 1st through 5th. So I was So it happened town. very fast. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very likely that you might have missed it because she was able to expose this image very quickly. And I have found sometimes you play a game with people you walk through where you show them the original painting or not. And this is the one that is most surprising to people, I think, with old master paintings, with representational painting in general, people have a kind of expectation if they see Vera's photograph of what the actual painting might look like. But with an abstract, with a non-representational non -representational painting, there's no real world referent about what the painting should be. And so you don't know what the colors will be like. There's no depth perception. So this is, for Frankenthaler, actually quite dramatic painting, but it's very colorful in real life. And there's no way to know what colors an abstract work like this would be in real life. And the other thing for me, this inversion with the unprimed canvas becoming now this dark ground and the dark paint becoming white, I. Uh, always read this mark making as like almost exuberant erasures. Like I imagine it, it's almost like a dark charcoal ground that has been erased um, where that's the gesture you're seeing rather than the, the paint splatter. You're 100% right. Like uh, this is, <laughs> it seems so foreign from the original. <laughs> it's, a, it's a completely different work. Of course, the gestures you kind of recognize, but even them being in reverse, since gestures are often made by the arc of the arm or the hand, is that you, you, you can read this painting differently when you see it, when the diagonal's going the other direction. Um, and it is, it, it's, it's like it's become cosmic. It's the opposite of that fresh, present paint color raw canvas, it's like cosmic into space in some completely other way. And I think Vera knew exactly what she was doing and why she wanted to, um, I know she loves Frankenthaler's work, but I think she knew this painting would be transformed through her process and be a completely different work. So it's a marvelous thing. And again, you can read it from, you know, 50 feet away in one way and then come up and look at the splatters in another way and then step back again. It's a different process, I think, of that 
the way you look at an abstract expressionist painting and sort of stand in front of it with your body. It's the size of your body and you relate to it in, in that way. It's become more graphic, obviously, um, more readable. I like the, this, this zigzag mark, the circles, all of a sudden the calligraphy of it becomes much more evident. And I think you're right. It is, when I used to make the drawings, you, you put all the charcoal on and then you erase the white out of it. It's, a, it's like it's a reverse process too, as you're seeing time in reverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the signature. Signature in reverse too. Yeah. I noticed that right away when I saw it. Yeah, and I did, and I wanted to mention too um, that this was a gift to LACMA from Vera herself. So it was oh, that's a right. lovely she gesture. She gave us this picture. Yeah. That's so nice. Well, Vera has been so generous with her time with us through the whole process, and I know is so frustrated that we haven't been able to open the show to the public. But we are going to extend the run of the show. <laughs> past the time when we're open so that the public can see the exhibition, uh, all of it, because there are many rooms. We're seeing it in detail, picture by picture, but as a whole, it's, it was intended to be like a mirror of the museum. The outside, the inside, the wide shot, the close shot, and the pictures hanging on the wall. So it's meta, 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 I think, as we've been describing it in different ways from the pictures to the whole arrangement that you conceived with.